Hello and welcome to the PC Gaming Week Spot, your recap of the last seven days in PC video gaming. My name is Colin Mahern and joining me this week. Uh, where did I put it? Joining me this week. This prize shows that this is not a cheesy event. This is a musical event, and what kind of event would it be without this man, Mr. Matthew Castle? Hello. Hello, Matthew. Is that Eurovision? That is. Ding, ding, ding. I, uh, I kind of fucking hate Eurovision. Uh, go on, go for it. Tell me, tell me why. Well, it's just not, I like, I've just, I've, I find it really naff. Um, uh, and... Like, I always hated it as a kid because my family were really into it. And, you know, back then it was just a case of going into another room. Um, but now there's this sort of, it basically, and this is, this is really curmudgeonly of me, but it basically triggers the worst night of bants on Twitter that you've ever heard. Because everyone does their Graham Norton thing of like mm. trying to be funny. And it's just like, a wall, just just a wall of of like thirty people all making the same bad jokes about music. I don't care for. Um, I thought it was quite f- funny that the chat got zero points because, like, the idea that you can't even get there's not one country in the world will throw you a point <laughs> is uh, whether or not he was deserving. I don't know. I mean, I suppose that's that's the weird thing about the Eurovision is that like, well, one like it's not a song competition. It is. Uh, like the devoting revolves around politics and you know the UK isn't the most popular country in the world at the minute and like uh, like I I haven't heard the song it could be the greatest song of all time that this guy did a uh, James something I think his name is um but yeah zero nil poa nil yeah. poa not great I don't know I just like, all, do, does anyone listen to any of the, any of these songs ever? Like after the Eurovision? Like, well, I mean, like, oh I mean, man, that's a bang. You, yeah, you a don't, bang. you don't, you don't get many Waterloo's or anything like that coming from the Eurovision these days. Yeah, like if it was, if it was genuinely like the World Cup of music, like everyone putting forward whoever they held to be, and however you you know you calculate this is obviously ridiculous but like the best band so it's genuinely like the 25 30 best bands in the world going at it that would be interesting that would be more interesting because instead it's just like who's the best at making a novelty eurovision song which Mm -hmm. is i mean i don't know a, a, a weird and silly thing but that is me being curmudgeon I'm sure everyone. I was just annoyed because normally lots of people use the hashtag Eurovision, which is very, very easy to mute on Twitter. Ah. This year there wasn't. And it got to a point where I genuinely thought, am I going to have to mute the name of all the countries? Is that the way to stop it from <laughs> happening on my feed? But I was like, do I really want to type in all the competitors and then have to unmute them? Because I do want to have insight into like global news beyond this evening. All right. Um, <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, you never hear any news about Italy I, ever I, I, again. The only <laughs> stopping this is so I can't. You can't write the word Italy or Iceland <laughs> on my Twitter feed. <laughs> um, so I just had to sit there and grip my teeth and um, just keep reminding myself that uh, that the other days of the year, the people I follow on Twitter are sound. It's this one evening that I guess they get a pass to be just just so fucking boring. But is that, uh, <laughs> I mean, is that not every day on Twitter? I mean, no, people no, make the same... I think I follow people who I genuinely like, but okay. it always upsets me that there is a tiny bit of, like, Venn diagram of, like, my friends and people who like Eurovision. And there's, like, a, an atom of it crosses over, um, which is, I mean, well, look, really you know, unacceptable. You got through it. So yeah. it was so anyway, like that's that's I mean that's a good five minutes on Eurovision. It this is, is the PC gaming week spot. <laughs> uh so do you know what? Let's talk about some video game news then. Oh, so yeah. get the bad taste of Eurovision out of my mouth. Yeah, and get some information snacks and in that gob of yours. Nom, 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 Info nom, 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 snacks nom, nom, for his gob. Oh god. <laughs> Where's Matthew gone? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. 
<laughs> I'm not sure where you've gone. Uh, been cancelled by the fans of Eurovision. That's odd. Yeah, yeah. Graham Norton has been ABBA have been in touch. Uh, oh, you're back now. Okay, I'm not sure what that was about. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yes, I've been replaced by a body double. I love Eurovision. <laughs> Everything I said was a lie. It is amazing. Uh, some information snacks for you, Matthew. Yeah, uh, Grand Theft Auto 3, remember that? Oh, yeah. oh, it's yeah, 20 years old this year. Oh, wow. And uh, Rockstar have said, quote, we'll have more fun surprises to share this was on top of just saying that it's 20 years old. I will have more fun surprises to share, including some specifically for GTA Online players. Now, I'm willing to bet that including some specifically for GTA Online means just the only surprises will be for GTA Online players. That's exactly what I was going to ask you. Are we, <laughs> is there any, any sliver of hope, maybe a remaster or something like that? But like, or is it just going to be, look... You can buy Claude's jacket or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, it's. I just don't know if they necessarily return to it because it's it's so old and sort of basic compared to what they do now. Mm. That I just don't know if they if they, you know, how much they want to kind of rub that in people's faces. Um, oh, it was good though back at the time. I remember good. looking at screenshots of it in Games Master and thinking. Oh wow, that looks amazing. We actually rented a um PlayStation 2 because we didn't have one. We rented mm-hmm. one from like Blockbuster or the video shop. Um just to play it for a weekend. Yeah. Oh boy, that is a that is a fancy old game. Well it, it was, was back then. It was I mean, it was just such a I mean, if you if you didn't play it at the time, it's hard to kind of put yourself in that mindset, but it was just such a leap from the second one, obviously, that it was just mind blowing. Like it was on it PC, was. you could put music into a folder and have it play through a radio, a special radio station in the car. And for whatever reason, our computer only had "I Get Around by the Beach Boys" on it. So was and that on so loop? <laughs> that was there was a radio station in my version of GTA Three that only played "I Get Around by the That's Beach Boys." Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, a video game that isn't 20 years old and is only a couple of months old is Valheim. And I have a little update because it's been a while since I have mm-hmm. updated you on Valheim numbers. The game has now sold 6.8 million copies worldwide. And Wowzers. it's worth remembering it was made by five people. Wow. As they, those people, they can buy a lot of cans of Fanta. They are living the high life. There used to be this figure of like... um game income per sort of employee Mm. and it always used to be that nintendo were like because you know for all the money they're making in the wii era they're Mm. also relatively lean in terms of headcount and like so per nintendo employer the employee of the big publishers they were Mm. making the most money however many millions but that's got to give them a run for that Mm. five people selling 6.8 million copies of valheim they must be doing well, in fairness. Well done um, to them. Indeed. Uh, a video game that isn't out yet is Overwatch 2, but Blizzard ran a stream in the last week. And the biggest change that they mentioned is they're reducing the, the team sizes. So first Overwatch was 6v6, but mm-hmm. Overwatch 2 is going to be 5v5. And that change is going to be reflected in the original Overwatch as well. So, Matthew, you're going to have to kick your least favourite friend out of your squad. It's going to be well, down. Be me getting kicked out of someone else's squad. Down, I down, down from six to five. Uh, here's a little bit of news that uh, makes me excited. Well, mm-hmm. I suppose I shouldn't really get excited yet, but there might, might be a new Tony Hawk on the way. So Jess Margera, who is the brother of Bam from Jackass fame and... I suppose he was in Tony Hawk as well. Uh, but yeah, Jess Margera is a member of the band called CKY. I always assumed it was Margera. I don't know why. Um, I think... Yeah, yeah. no, it is, Mar- it is Margera. Margera sounds... So, yeah. Now you say it, I'm like, yeah, it sounds better. Uh, but <laughs> this, this guy was on a podcast called Behind Closed Doors, which I find quite funny with what he went on to say. But uh, he... He was talking about the pandemic, I think, and, you know, we weren't be able to, we weren't touring and it's the importance of licensing deals and whatever else and uh, being a musician. And the interviewer asked him if 
CKY had been in a Tony Hawk game and he said, yeah, and I believe we're doing the new one coming out too. Now, somebody, uh, I saw in an article, like the only Tony Hawk game that had CKY music in it was previously, was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. So maybe a 3 plus 4 remake? Perhaps. I mean, I'd be excited. I would mm. like I would like more yeah, Tony Hawk. Pro Skater 4 is the one that I played lots of on the GameCube. I think, yeah, I remember you saying that, yeah. So, you know, maybe you'll get to relive mm. those glory days once more. Fingers crossed. Uh, and finally, Paradox announced on Friday that a sequel to 2010's Victoria 2, which is cleverly titled Victoria 3, is coming. And this is something the fans have been calling for for ages. So... Hopefully those fans will be happy. And that's all I have to say on that. Matthew, are you the we'll same? we have to get uh, Nate on at some point to do a little pre-recorded segment, which Nate explains what Paradox Grand strategy games, are. games. yeah. <laughs> uh, so those are your information snacks this week. So now let's get on to the bigger news stories in Headlines and Hot Takes. <laughs> I'm Hugh Edwards. Working in news is exciting. Yes, headlines and hot takes is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we take you through the bigger news stories of the past week. And there was only one, really. I mean, if we knew a lot about Grand Strategy, then maybe the Victoria stuff. But uh, Time Splitters! Time Splitters is back! What is this about? So, um, Deep Silver took to Twitter last week. And they announced this, that they are reforming the Time Splitter studio, Free Radical Design. I like to think of them as the second site studio. Uh, but yeah, they're reforming them with, quote, key original members. Uh, and those key original members being Steve Ellis and David Doak, who you might know from Goldeneye as Dr. Mm-hmm. Doak. Um, they... they They haven't started developing this yet. Um, This is all, it seems to be very much early doors, but um, Embracer Group, the parent company, said that the new studio studio is going to be in the home of the original Free Radical, Nottingham. And uh, there's a quote here, to finally be able to, to confirm that the studio has been formed and that we have a plan for the next Time Splitters game is incredible. While we cannot tell you anything more at the moment, we look forward to sharing information in the future. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, a big one. Like People have been waiting a long time for Time Splitters to come back. 16, yeah, 16 years since the mm-hmm. last Time Splitters which was called Future Perfect, the third Time Splitters. And a couple of years back, there was also a Time Splitters remake that was doing the rounds. But I think that was a fan-made remake, I should say, but it never actually came out. Wasn't there a out. playable version of it in, um, in home one front. of the Homefront games? Yeah, there was a, a playable version of Time Splitters 2 in Homefront The Revolution. Uh, because, yes, I suppose, Crytek bought Free Radical and they made it Crytek UK. And they ran yeah. that until 2014. And then Deep Silver bought them. And uh, yeah, no, they, I, I don't know. It just kind of petered out, I suppose, a little bit. But yeah, seems to be, seems to be coming back. So I suppose, what, what's your history with Time Splitters, Matthew? Um, not, to, not to be too much of sort of a miserablest, but my... History of Time Splitters is wondering why everyone else likes Time Splitters so much. Um, <laughs> this was a rare game in the not a rare game. I mean, they left rare. <laughs> uh, the rarest. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, the wordplay there. This was yeah. a this this was. A, oh my god, my cat just ran in. Is, ever, is everything okay? Yeah, does the yeah, cat want, does the cat want to say anything about Time Splitters? No. Mm. Here you go. Whoa. Um, it, it can open doors. It's it's a very impressive. <laughs> it's terrifying. Uh, yeah, anyway, so this was a rare game at the time that, like, you know, it got, like, you know, Time Splitters 2, I'm talking about anyway, got, like, 90s across the board. The magazines I read were absolutely nuts for it. Um, and it's probably, like, the 90 I disagreed with most in terms of I bought it, and I just, I never, ever clicked with, with Time Splitters. It's got this very strange... Um, Sort of slightly spongy arcade feel to me. Like 
you know, some people say it's just this, it's got the same feel as Goldeneye. It's you know, it's it's got a lot of the, the sort of same same brains behind it. But there was just something un, there was something off about the shooting in it for for my tastes that meant that whatever its strengths, I could never ever get into it. You know, like the campaign, which kind of takes so the whole thing in time splitters is that you're jumping through different time periods, chasing these sort of time manipulating villains. Um, and it lets you have all this kind of like um, sort of period specific weaponry. So you can kind of go into the 1930s and it's all Tommy guns. And then there's like the future and it's all lasers or whatever. Um, you know, which on paper is great fun. Um, and, you know, what most people really love about Time Splitters is, you know, it has this huge suite of split screen multiplayer, like very much in the tradition of like Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. Um, you know, it was kind of the the last sort of big version of that, I guess, you know, because obviously, you know, there there wasn't another shooter like this, or, you know, in terms of split screen from Rare, you know, in the GameCube era. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people, it kind of just, it, you know, I think it went gold and I perfect dark and then people moved on to time splitters too. But yeah, I just never, never quite clicked with me. And even though, you know, it had all this, you know, these kind of zany modes and zany characters, um, I always found it a little bit too cartoonish because it's all like, you know, the characters are sort of like clowns and monkeys and nuns and things like that. And I don't know. Just never, never really clicked with me. Um, but it, like, I know plenty of people who absolutely adore this game. Uh, like when I joined uh, Future, when I was working on Game, I remember I think it was Games Radar used to play this split screen. Like this was still their split screen game. I don't know if that was two or three. I, I, I never got three because um, you know I sort of bounced off two so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a weird one because like I always assumed they stopped making it because it like wasn't sort of popular enough or wasn't sort of successful enough. So it feels like like whenever I hear people are like, we want time splitters back, I just assume it's like 20 very enthusiastic loudmouths online rather than, you know, I can think of other things which have had a resurgence, which maybe had a, you know, bigger, bigger kind of crowd behind them. Like like basically uh, um, the, the epitome of a cult classic. It didn't sell yeah, well enough, but it was critically but, acclaimed and people liked yeah, it. Yeah, and, and so th 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 there's a bit of that. There's also like, and I've seen this said of this news, like it's quite hard to imagine what time splitters would be in this day and age because I think you could go for the nostalgic split screen thing, but I don't know if just our tastes have moved on, you know, mm. and that it wouldn't, uh, you know we're kind of living this sort of online age like local multiplayer stuff isn't as big as it used to be and it's still fun but it's just not like the culture of specific you know definitely around shooters and stuff like i've played a few games in the last ever five ten years where people have gone back to this kind of you know they have done split screen and it's it's like a they've done it as like a nostalgic gimmick rather mm -hmm. than this is the best form or this is the natural form for the genre. It, you know, there's a few games which have been like, oh, remember this? Wasn't this fun? You know, when yeah. we used to gather together on sofas rather than, you know, this is like a, this is a sensible way of doing business in an age where all our consoles are connected. You know, the idea of like, I don't know, I mean, we've got like, we haven't even got four, you know, who has four Xbox, four, four PlayStation pads yeah. in yeah, this yeah, day yeah. and age? They're like 100 quid, aren't they? They're ridiculous, those controllers. Did, um, do you remember that GoldenEye remit? Was it GoldenEye Reloaded? Or, yeah. Because I was going to ask. Well, like, that, was you know, gold, that was Perfect Dark HD that they did on 360. Uh Oh, do you mean the god? Do you mean the the actual the proper remake of Golden and not the rumored HD? Thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, like, did that have split screen multiplayer, or did that go down as sort of an online route? That that did have split screen. I think. Oh god, I kind of tried to push that from my mind because I thought it was pure ass. They basically took all the beats of Goldeneye and tried to turn it into a Call of Duty campaign, which is a very different kind of shooter. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's also, just they inserted Daniel Craig into it. And it's Goldeneye. Daniel Craig yeah, wasn't yeah. in that film. That's ridiculous. Because um, <laughs> I, I was just going to ask, like, if, if, if that did well and, like, would 
time splitters could they kind of learn from that but it is yeah like uh, you know online shooters are a lot of the time now either battle royales or you know it's all about team deathmatch and whatever else and but it is you know he, like you in that country me in this country like and all of us kind of spread around the world yeah, yeah. It's, I, I just I just think the the expectations of how shooters behave, like in terms of their actual like makeup, is is quite different now. Um, you know, you basically like we you know we're still living in the shadow of Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which comes mm. in and basically establishes like this is this is now how shooters work. Like this is what people expect in terms of like leveling systems, character development, perks, all this kind of stuff. You know, it's stuck around for a reason. Well, this is just, you know, this was riding the wave of like gold and I came along and kind of invented what the, you know, multiplayer shooters were going to be in that period. This is just such an artifact of that time. You know, I just don't know how they'd, you know, make it almost like complicated enough for modern tastes. Right. Because, you know, the appeal of this is like simplicity. It's there's a pick up and play element to these older shooters. It's this idea that you go in and you collect the guns from the arena and, you know, there isn't like a sense of progression necessarily. You know, it's it's quite kind of pure and simple. And I think if you try and like overcomplicate that, you step on the toes of what made these games good. If you don't try and update it, it'll just feel old as hell. Like it's a, it's an interesting challenge for sure. Um, but maybe like I'm just out of the time splitters loop and there are so many millions of fans that they can sustain something like this but my read is that there isn't I mean yeah it, it, do, it does feel maybe a bit more like a, a cult classic but I don't know like th- there was a bit of buzz around that fan remake and maybe a remaster trilogy mm. even like stick with the three original games in there um, like that could get fans back on side before you do a new They're entry very, in the series. I, I just, if, you, if you did like big HD remasters, of these, they'd feel old as hell. I mean, Time Splitters 1 particularly is like a real first attempt at like what, what they would later do. Um, it's very, very, very basic. So um, do, do you think they would actually be better off just to, that was that, and now here is Time Splitters 4 or whatever. Like here is the new era of Time Splitters. Yeah, I, if, I think if you're going to do anything, do that rather than just, you know, the nostalgia rush of something which is I just I don't know I like I thought it felt felt old and off back then so mm. like I said I'm probably in a minority on this um you know I don't feel I'm not like as I'm not like anti time split as I should say I'm just I'm just not a fan you know it's it's not I don't feel the sort of violence towards it that I feel towards Spyro and Crash Bandicoot say you know I'm not I'm not I'm not grouping it in with like actively bad things it's a it's a, a, I assume, a good thing that I don't get. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't know. Uh, I, it's, people are excited about it. And, you know, more luck to you if you're looking forward to getting more time splitters. Hopefully it will live up to the, the game that you've played in your head for the last 15 or so years. Uh, but often, often comebacks don't really go that way. But we'll see. You know, or, you know, it could be a bit like um, I think recently you've had a few teams that have tried to kind of tap into like the kind of glory days, mm-hmm. you know, of kind of early to mid noughties. You know, like you look at the Three Fields Entertainment, who were the split off from Criterion, who tried to do the sort of but. The burnout games without the sort of burnout license, right. the yeah. dangerous driving and things like that. Um, and sometimes, you know, speaking to those fans, like by all means, really impress a hundred people. But if you weren't there and if you weren't riding that nostalgia wave, um, it's kind of, I don't know, it feels like a, ri- a slightly riskier space. Um, mm. But, you know, I hope they do all right. You want everyone to do well. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, best, best of luck to them. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, Time Splitters Four or whatever they're going to call it is uh, turns out to be. They should do it like a t- they should do it like a. Um, they're still jumping through time periods, but they're jumping through like 
the 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 history of first person shooters. They should do the history of first person in, in so it's it's actually like mechanically you pay homage to them and they they they're kind of funny games as well. You could spoof them a bit. So you could actually go through you have a level which is like just pure time splitters somewhere in the middle and then you move on to like your modern shooters and you can go back to like your dooms or whatever. Yeah. I li- I like that idea. I mean they've probably covered in three games have they covered a lot of the time periods anyway, you know? Uh, well, time periods with guns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we will see. We will see. Uh, a video game that uh, hasn't, well, I don't know. It's kind of been informally announced, I suppose. Um, but Gearbox is working on a video game that isn't Borderlands. Mm. So this was... Again, revealed, not bombastically, but it was uh, during an earnings call um, where uh, Take-Two said that Gearbox Software are going to be releasing a new video game um, sometime between now and March 31st, 2022. Uh, They also added that uh, they plan to release 21 games, not Gearbox, but Take-Two, and that includes four, quote, immersive core titles. Uh, And they said two of those four will be from, quote, proven franchises and the other two will be, quote, new games, Uh, which you would imagine one of them would be one of those new games would be um, the new game from Gearbox Software. So you liked Borderlands 3. I don't know. Would I be talking out of turn to say you like Borderlands? You liked Borderlands 3 at the very least. Yes. Um, So like, I don't know. It. What would you like to see from Gearbox as their next big game? Would you like to see them take much from Borderlands? Uh, oh, I don't, I, it, it doesn't see any point doing something which is Borderlands-esque that's not set in the Borderlands world, you know? Right. So you kind of, you either kind of do more Borderlands or you don't do more Borderlands. Um, have they said at all, like, if this is like a retail thing or a free-to-play thing? No. I mean, it would kind of make sense. You'd think, you know, you could see Take Two saying, you know, why don't we have a go at, you know, they don't have a big free to play thing, do they? They, You know, they don't really, do they? No. In the way that the others do. I mean, they kind of, I felt like the last one, the Battleborn, that was like an attempt at. Like, let's try and have an e-sporty kind of game. Let's try and have an Overwatch or a, let's have a, you know, it, it was kind of, a, it occupied a weird space. It was like a whole mix of things, wasn't it? They were very unlucky as well in that it came out, like it came out right around the time of Overwatch, didn't it? It was a little bit of the, um, uh, oh, what was it, Armageddon and whatever the other film was. That wasn't Armageddon. I mean, you see it a lot. Deep impact, that's it. Uh, But, so like, they were a little unlucky in terms of timing. Now, to be fair, people also, you know, said it it wasn't great either. Um, But yeah, they did. I love that that famous tweet where Randy Pitcher was explaining like what it is. And he was like, Battleborn. And then it was just like 30 words of like contradictory jargon. It was like, it's, (laughs) and everyone was like, oh, well, that's, that's that explained. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but yeah they, they take two are lacking a, a Fortnite or a, um, an Apex or whatever else so I don't know do you, do, so are you thinking maybe rather than yeah rather than big retail I've got, I've got, sorry I've got to read this tweet out because it's Please. Uh, Battleborn is FPS hobby grade co-op campaign genre blended multi-mode competitive esports Meta growth choice plus epic Battleborn heroes. That was his tweet. That is that's Mad Libs. That is what. what? <laughs> like, all right, what's that? <laughs> what the fuck is that? What's mean? going on? Did he sit? Did he sit on his phone and it just typed out all? Of, that's <laughs> that's wild. Um, I love it. All the replies are just like what. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, so you're thinking perhaps Battle Royale. Maybe, or, or, or like another attempt at kind of character shooter type thing. Mm. I mean, like, you could sort of see what they were doing with Battleborn, that they were trying to sort of build on this, you know, 
quite strong personality led stuff that they were doing in Borderlands, you know, and character creation and art design or whatever is, is feels like a a sort of strength of theirs that they probably want to kind of lean into. Um, You know, you could see them trying to have a go at a kind of a sort of apex legendsy kind of thing. I I just feel like, you know, for something that's allegedly going to be coming out quite soon, like normally they have quite a lead in on their big retail games. You know, they're like Borderlands 3 is coming and then you have like a year of them talking about it and da 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 where the model with some of these, you know, online things, and maybe I'm thinking specifically of Apex Legends here, is to just sort of go for it. You know, in terms of like launching something in the next, something which we've not heard about in the next, whatever, six months. Mm-hmm. I feel like that feels more like something you do with kind of free to play stuff than, than retail. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, yeah, you're, you brought up Apex, like they, they, so they announced, announced it. And then yeah. it came out like a week later. It was yeah. like crazy fast. And you just make it, because with these games, like, they, you, you know, you just come in and make a big impact, a big splash. You know, you don't let people kind of get bored with the idea. You have to yeah. get as many people on board as, you know, so, you know, that is one way of launching those games is to have the exciting kind of like, doosh, you know, it all lands at once. I mean, uh, other people have, you know, I, mean, that, I, mean, I would say that is the model for how those games get released. Yeah, you know, no, I, I, they I think that's similar, the same thing with fair. that hyperscape. Um, yeah. Ubisoft, that's suddenly, poof, you know, and that's, I mean, other publishers try it different ways. They have this kind of like long beta period or they sort of seed the idea early. Um, it feels like lots of people haven't really worked out um, like 100% what they're doing with these things, but they, they tend to happen faster than like Borderlands 3 had like a big run into it. Like you build up a big old, a big old um, pre-order campaign or whatever. Um, so when they when they said, "Oh, this thing's going to happen by next March," I thought, "Ah, it doesn't feel like a that's a, quite a, a big new first person shooter series or whatever else." Yeah, yeah. Also, like, will they have simply will they have had the time to have made, you know, all the team size or whatever to have made another, you know, Borderlands s quite substantial game? I'm not mm. saying like Battle Royales are easier to make, but on paper there are. It feels like there are, you know, the quicker avenues to that. But I don't know. That might be hugely ignorant of me. I don't know. That, that, that's a very fair point. The whole, like, it, it's coming out relatively soon. Um, 2K don't have a big free-to-play thing to to go up against your Apexes, your Fortnites, or whatever else. So, yeah, maybe they're like Gearbox. Make us a, a shooty Battle Royale, please. So. I don't know. We shall see. Hooray. Um, But what's that coming over the hill? It is a tech corner, Matthew. And what a tech corner. As I just pull up this article here from IGN.com. Matthew, somebody's made a PC. That's a GameCube. Oh, this is all right. This is my kind of tech corner. Check this out. Look, it looks like a GameCube, but it's not. No, it's, it's, it's a GameCube case with PC parts inside. Yes. Yes, it is. Look, you have the fan there and everything. This oh, is yeah. terrific. This is playing well in the audio version. Uh, yeah. But, but <laughs> yes. Ooh. Ah. A Reddit user shared these pictures. Um, look, you, all you need to know, basically, if you're listening to this, is somebody stuck a PC in a GameCube. Not the most powerful PC in the world, but a PC nonetheless. Uh, so, Matthew, my question to you is, what is the best game on GameCube? And is it Time Splitters? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, oh. Resident Evil 4? Yeah, probably. Um, closely followed by Smash Brothers on GameCube was really, really good. Played that loads. I actually really liked Mario Kart Double Dash as well. Um, that was a big game for us at university. I mean, Resident Evil 4, I think, is by far my favourite GameCube game. I mean, it's one of my top five games of all times. I mean, Wind Waker's great. Not the best Zelda. It is great, though. Um, Mario Sunshine is very solid. <laughs> 
it's it's not um at the time i thought mario sunshine was like absolutely the shit like couldn't get any better but then galaxy just abs- absolutely blew me away and i replayed sunshine when it came out on switch weather last year um and like it holds a better like i hadn't played it a long time and it holds up better than i thought it i thought it would it's still it's still got some absolutely amazing ideas but quite a quite a muddled game um I also really liked Eternal Darkness. Do you remember that? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. The, the um, kind of Lovecraft Dennis thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's hilarious that one because there's all these patents for it for like insanity systems, and it's people from Silicon Knights and Miyamoto because he did have a hand in it. And I like the idea that like Miyamoto had this hand in this super bleak yeah. kind of reality bending Lovecraft horror game because it's so far from his from his other things. Um, Oh, Eternal Darkness is really, really good. That's a shame, like, like that, you know. Too human happened, coming. and yes. Yeah, because he tried coming back, didn't he, with um, mm. uh, a Kickstarter for it, for, like, an Eternal Darkness-esque thing. And, you know, I worry that's a bit like Time Spitters. There's a lot of noisy people online who say they like Eternal Darkness, but when push comes to shove... Yeah, and other games have, like, you know... Other games have done similar things since, and like I suppose it was cool at the time. At the time, it was kind of like when the first time you come across Psychomantis, and Psychomantis is all like, "You love pro evolution soccer, don't you?" You're like, "How does he know?" Uh, so like when the game sort of played with um, your expectations, just like yeah, like like Eternal Darkness. Mm. Uh, it was cool, but I suppose maybe now in 2021, yeah. Yeah, mm. there was the uh, Metal Gear remake on GameCube as well, Twin Snakes. Mm. Yeah, The Resident Evil 1 remake, absolutely glorious. My God, that had some that had some amazing graphics for a tiny purple box, a little tiny purple cube. Um, God bless the GameCube. What a lovely, what a lovely little console. <laughs> One of my favourite controllers ever. The A button on the GameCube controller. It's probably the best button in all of gaming. It's so the, big. The best singular button. <laughs> yeah, it's massive. <laughs> uh, so those are your headlines and hot takes for this week. So now let's get on to the games we've been playing in the last seven days in show and tell. Show and tell, show and tell. We can't afford a proper jingle. Jingle. It's meant to be jingle. Yes, show and tell is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we take you through the video games that we've been playing over the last seven days. And I have been playing a game that I was really looking forward to uh, for quite a while. And actually, I think that a history lesson is required in some ways for Ooh, those yeah, what, people love history lessons. Uh they do history is important, you know, you got to remember the past to build the future or whatever Solid Snake said that one time. Biomutant is a well, first of all, it's a third person open world action game with RPG elements sprinkled in. There's a morality system, skill points, so on. I'll touch on all of them as we go. But if you're not aware of the game, then you definitely won't be aware of its development history. And that is important for what I'm going to say in a second, right? So announced in 2017, originally meant to be out in 2018, I think it was. And then it had its release date pushed loads throughout the years. All of that is important to just have in your head when I say this next bit. Because, oh, Matthew, Biomutant feels like an old game. Right. When I say an old game, I don't mean one from 20 years ago, all right? I mean one from... mm, the early to mid 2010s. And that does feel like a different time in open world games. Let's call it pre-Breath of the Wild. Right. Those heady days when Ubisoft were just flooding their map with needless, samey, throwaway activities. Mm. If you love that busy work, then you will quite enjoy what Biomutant has to offer. Because it is full of fetch quests and full of these little diversions that revolve around the same type of puzzle. Right. These diversions, these little puzzles, basically, our world, the human world, is referred to as the old world because we destroyed the world, right? Oh, God, that's so us, isn't it? Oh, totally. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we destroyed the world and a lot of our old technology is scattered around by a mutant. So that'll be like telephones, toilets, washing machines, whatever else. And when you come across these, 
you get these little rotation puzzles where you must match up the colours using little twisty knobs and then you get XP when you complete it. And there's mm-hmm. typically about five of these. So there'll be five microwaves, five washing machines, five whatever else it is, right? And when you've done, I don't know, one or two, you go, oh, it's the same trick over and over and over again. And it becomes incredibly tired very, very fast. There are other little diversions, I suppose, that don't necessarily involve these old world technologies and they are just as frequent. You know, save the captives from the bandits. There's about 20 odd of them or so. Mm -hmm. Interact with notice boards. Again, I think there's about 15 or so of them. That just means walk up to a notice board and, and press a button. Yeah, it just gets tired very quickly because they're all pretty much the same. But the fetch quests I mentioned, they're a little more involved. Like they require you going up to an NPC, having a bit of a back and forth, but they're still fetch quests. You might get a bit of gear at the end, but after doing a handful of those, it's very difficult to G yourself up to talk to another uh, uh, talking animal. Mm. As, As uninspiring as this optional content is, one of my big issues with these side quests, these little diversions, the, the, the saving the captives, the going up to the NPCs, whatever else, all these side quests, they're all under the one banner and one icon on the map. And that is sort of reflective of, of a wider issue I have with Biomutant. I suppose, firstly... It's just on the map, it becomes totally overwhelming because in an open world game, if I know I'm going from A to B, I like to plot my route and say I could do these side quests along the way and, you know, I could focus on the more rewarding ones. But here, it's just, there's like a yellow circle for the main quest and blue circles for our hexagons or whatever they are. Because Assassin's Creed Valhalla sort of did that and I quite liked that it it sort of... um... Gave equal weight. Yeah, or it just sort of grouped everything in like, here's something interesting and like the surprise of what it was, was, I don't know, played into it a bit. It's just... <sighs> maybe it speaks to the activities themselves, but just maybe it held my attention a bit more. That's a lot of the problem is that the, like, the activities here are, as I said, you know, it'll be find five of, the, of uh, little sp- or big spinny globes or five guitars or five whatever it is. And it just feels like you're repeating the same thing over and over. Mm. The difficulties within the UI is spread across the entirety of the game, basically. Like that mm. awkwardness translates to the crafting, the equipping of gear, the, the fact that there are three lots of skill points. Everything outside of the combat is overcomplicated. Right. The crafting, right? You would imagine in this RPG, quite important. It's mostly fairly pointless. I really did. I really wanted to engage in this system and I wanted to make my little cat man the most vicious cat man in all the land. I was going to make him just, you know, a, p- a little powerhouse. I think I crafted maybe about five or six weapons over the course of 22 hours, I think it was. Right. Now, is it, is it crafting new things rather than upgrading things you already have? So you can do both. You get loot, like, you know, you um, you scavenge buildings and you pick up loot and you can use that loot to create new guns, new melee weapons, or you can upgrade guns and melee weapons that you have. Mm. But maybe, I don't know, maybe I was just lucky very early on and I got strong loot, but I just never found myself in a position where I needed new weapons that all, all that often or that I needed to upgrade my weapons all that often. Because, right. you know, that's what it ultimately comes down to. Like when crafting a weapon, will I get a higher number than the previous number? And if I don't, well, what's the point in engaging in the system? And uh, so these buildings that you loot as well, loads of them and my God, loads of loot. Now, this is a, a minor thing, but it's just, you know, it's a game that is full of these little minor things. When you collect loot... And I'm not talking Arthur Morgan and Red Dead too slow here, but whenever you pick up an item, a little screen pops up telling you what you picked up, the benefits of each item, etc, etc. Now you can skip past it relatively quickly. And if you take one isolated instance of this, you go, what's the problem here? Calm down, Colin. You're, you're kicking off now over something that isn't that big. But it's just the sheer volume of loot, the amount of stuff you are collecting means that you have you come across this a lot of the time and it grates more than it should because it just takes you out of the world. Right, right. A world that is lovely and a world I want to be in. It's that abundance of loot 
that, yeah, you're constantly getting, uh, uh, wrestling with the UI, I suppose, and the loot never really feels special because of the amount that's in it. So that's, that sounds to me a little bit like, so this, I know this is a new studio. It's not a new team. They've got some like experienced people on there. They come from like, I think I want to say Avalanche. Just, got, like, yeah, Just Cause, yeah. They got like Just Cause in their blood, which was another game which had like a huge open world and sort of had to resort to quite a lot of like repetition and padding to actually fill it. Do you think it's that? Do you think it's just that they've built a big open world and like, you know, being a relatively small team, they've had to sort of not fill it in an easy way, but fill it in a, you know, a way which kind of like you can see through a bit too easily. Perhaps. Uh, I mean, that would explain the repetition in the activities that you do in the side quests and the main quests as well. Mm. But that doesn't really explain the issues with the UI. It's incredibly fiddly. Like there's a separate menu for every little thing like this is the separate menu for crafting there's a separate menu for equipping gear there's a separate menu for telling you the points that your character has there's a separate menu for spending each individual point it's just it's needlessly convoluted in that way so like i i i take your point yeah totally new studio i was really pulling for him and maybe they've had to pad out other aspects of the game but i don't know i i don't know how to justify the other issues. Yeah. Even, even the three, the three separate point systems for special abilities. It just seems unnecessary. It, it gets in the way of what is occasionally a quite enjoyable combat system. Can you tell me about the combat? Well, like, so I, I remember seeing this early on and it had this like massive scale to it, this big open world. They were clearly pushing that, but at the same time, the individual encounters seem to have a bit more like character and style to them than you might expect from an open world game. Like it almost seemed like they were talking a uh, kind of devil may cry ish yeah, yeah. action system embedded in an open world, which I thought sounded quite tantalizing when I first saw this in 2017, I think. Devil may cry is probably the best comparison point really, because mm. there, there, there are complexities to, to the combat, you know, well, I suppose, first of all, you have swords and guns. Um, mm. I, I will say, like, don't expect combat on the level of your favourite action games or just, again, to use a Devil May Cry. But you, there is openness in how you play. So, like, you can dual wield guns, you can focus on melee attacks, you can carry a sword and a heavy shotgun and you can, you know, dip between the two, mixing your weapons and your abilities as well that you acquire through those three different skill points and all that can result in some some good fun because like the abilities you acquire are relatively different to give you a taste by the end of the game i had a dash that i could use that would just fire me into the faces of enemies and do damage i could shoot ice up from the ground which would cause damage and whenever enemies would walk across it they'd be slipping and sliding they'd lose their footing and i could also shoot electricity from my little paws and that that's just that's just a few so like there's depth there like even i haven't even mentioned the Super Wong Fu, yes. No, you haven't. <laughs> Please do. There are a lot of wrinkles to this game in every aspect of it. But like the Super Wong Fu turns you into a time-limited thunder bastard, I suppose. Um, right. And you trigger that by uh, performing three successful combo attacks. So yeah, you do whatever. You do your three combos. And then for however many seconds, you have four available actions to you that will just do serious damage. Mm. Juggling all this, juggling the basic attacks, juggling the Super Wong Fu, juggling your abilities, juggling just your weapons. Once you get the hang of it, that aspect is pretty intuitive and it plays relatively well. Some of the weapons do feel a bit weightless, but I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a positive. And this, this, is, this is good. It looks quite spectacular in full float. Like, you know, there's lots of whiz-bang particle effects, the, the sound effects, the being sort of written, oh, so got onomatopoeia and all that kind of stuff. That looks fun. It does work well. Like, you know, you, you see the moves of the, the combos popping up when you perform them successfully. As you say, there is a bit of that... Adam West, Batman, Kablamo, Pow, whatever yeah. else, that kind of comic book style, which 
gives it life. And there is a parry system as well. I should mention talking about Batman, there's a little white flash that appears above enemies that you can parry them and inflict damage. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, like all of it works relatively all right once you get in a groove. It's I mean, I can't compare it to a Devil May Cry, to a Bayonetta, to whatever your favourite action game is, whatever, something from Platinum. That, that would be a step too far, really. But still, yeah, once you get in the groove, pretty all right. Now, I suppose that's as good a time as any to talk about something that isn't all right, which is the reason you're here, the execution of the stories, the characters you come across. I mean, yeah, I already mentioned it, but yes, humans, us, we've made shit of the place. And animals are living in it now and they're trying to trying to fix it, basically. You specifically are looking to sort out this war that's broken out amongst a few tribes. And you have to defeat these four monsters called World Eaters. They're devouring something called the Tree of Life, as you'd imagine. A pretty important tree. The dialogue in this, right, the only way I can describe it is incredibly odd. This isn't why it's odd. I'll tell you why it's odd in a second. But it's all delivered through a narrator. Uh, The characters make these gibberish noises that aren't as annoying as Banjo-Kazooie. Nowhere near. So I'll say that. That's something. But what these characters say is a mixture of... uh, It's a mixture of something a Cambridge philosophy student would stick in their dissertation and words you'd hear on an episode of In the Night Garden. It is. Such a contrast, and it is so jarring. Every character will ultimately, I, you know, I've made reference to it, the, the fetch quest, they'll ultimately ask you to go somewhere and get something for them. But before you leave, they'll deliver these wordy soliloquies that don't do much to, pu- uh, much to push the story forward and feel just needless, really. But they'll also call guitars... Things like Twing Twangs or an arcade cabinet, a bleep bloop cupboard. I mean, that is what I call them, so... <laughs> I think microwaves are fry sparkers and mechanics are tinker tonkerers. And, you know, it, it is a choice that they fully commit to, so fair play. It's they really go for it. It just didn't gel with me. I found it, uh, yeah, too much of a jarring contrast. It just doesn't land. Like, a, I know the premise isn't breaking new ground about humans being bastards and making shit of the world. Hashtag not all humans. (laughs) And, you know, whatever this new species coming up and trying to fix it or whatever. Like, yeah, doesn't break new ground, but I I was alright with it and I was ready to, you know, tell me your story. But it's just... The characters say a lot without saying much. So do you, actually. Not you personally, Matthew, (laughs) but uh, in in the game. Because there is, I think I mentioned this, there is a morality system. So when you're talking to NPCs, you'll have dialogue options and uh, you'll be given certain opportunities in the game as well to perform either light or dark actions. Paragon and Renegade, basically. Mm. I I can't really, like I was mostly going for the nicey-nicey approach, so I can't say if you were playing as a bastard, if you, you would get a wildly different experience. But it didn't seem like there were these massively contrasting branching paths. To me, but I can't say that for definite. Mm. But, but yeah, the morality system seems just a bit... I don't think it's necessary in the game. I would have nearly whipped it out and focused on your looting and your crafting a little bit more or something like that. It sounds like it's just kind of a small, uh, I think, 18 people and very ambitious team has maybe a bit enough more than they can chew or like spread themselves a little thin, perhaps. Perhaps. Like... To be fair, to give them their due in something that I I haven't really spoken about much, the world is genuinely gorgeous. Like, and this kind of goes back, I suppose, to to the combat and like the the things popping up. But yeah, like the world is great. This always demoed really well because of that. You were like, when they said we're this small team, you look at it and think, I mean, this this looks like substantial and kind of like beautiful. You know, I don't know if that's because it's got (laughs) colour. Another game's tone. (laughs) Yeah, it it does. um, It does show well against just regular brown uh, action games, but like it, it it is like it's 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 gorgeous. Like you know, they're like lovely dusty deserts and like real green forests and kind of these alien flora and fauna about the place. It's really nice. Like it looks nice and either like there's a day or night cycle and oh, but there are just 
but there's just little issues here as well. Uh, uh, so there are inhospitable parts of the game, right, where it will be, like, you know, beautiful areas, but some areas will be radioactive or they'll be too hot or too cold or too whatever it is. And you'll see a little percentage thing count up in the top corner and when that reaches 100% you'll die quite quickly Mm. and these just don't come into play nearly enough for me they're sort of off the beaten beaten path now maybe that rewards people for going hunting for loot or whatever but I don't know who needs more loot in this game Mm. but it's just yeah it's just something that like actually I thought that's something that they could have used more of funnily enough I was really looking forward to this it was one of my most anticipated games of the year actually um, and I don't know, it just hasn't lived up to the game that I thought I would be playing in my head. It has some good parts. The combat is pretty good when you get into a flow. As I said, it looks gorgeous. But what Biomutant does is it gets in the way of itself far too often. Because you will be enjoying the combat and kind of flitting between all the different systems um, but then, I don't know, you'll have to talk to a character and he'll just spout absolute wallop at you. You'll be like, oh, all right, OK. Or you'll go over here and you'll solve these I rotation puzzles. that's what puzzles. I do on this podcast, to be that's honest. That's true, I suppose it should be and used to show, it. video show. Um, but, like, yeah, shame. Good proof of concept for Biomutant 2, maybe. Um, mm. But ultimately, uh, yeah, just a, just a bit of a shame. Just a... A bit of a shame, really. Um, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, that it's a shame vibes from you. <laughs> I was so looking forward to it, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, I'm so looking forward to it. I'm, I'm still, I'm, 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 I'm still going to play this one. I'm looking forward to playing you it. Should. Um, yeah. Like, I like to try and play everything that I've covered or written about at some point, and you know, I think I was, I think we first saw this when I was back on magazines still. So it's. It's a long time coming, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a long time coming. Um, so yeah, so that's Biomutant. Uh, we are going to take a very quick break, and then we will be back with more video game chess. Ooh. Listen to the Electronic Wireless Show, RockPaperShotgun.com's PC gaming podcast. I'm Nate. I'm Matthew. And I'm Alice. And every Thursday, we chat about our favourite things in PC games. That could be the greatest giants, the coolest magic, or the best mysteries. Although Alice will have to stop me making every episode all about fish, or Anthony Hopkins, or Rome. So check out the Electronic Wireless Show every Thursday, available on all your podcatching apps or direct from RockPaperShotgun.com. Matthew. Hello. Scan my mind. What can you tell me? Read my mind. What's going on in that head of mine? Well, I am the last person you'd want scanning your mind based on my performance in Mind Scanners, uh, which came out last week. Uh, This is developed by The Outer Zone and is a sort of papers please-ish Um sort of techno sort of thriller where you play as an agent of a future society who is trying to um, sort of dig out, uh, well, very broadly, insanity is how the game refers to it, in the population. Um, The idea of, you know, sort of censoring the population a little bit and, 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 um, yeah, so the, the way it works is... You know, you have um, you have a big city, and you have people that have kind of popped up on your radar as people in need of some help, and you go and interview them. And you know, we're in like papers, please. You know, you're obviously interviewing people to kind of come into the border. Here, you're trying to sort of a work out if there's anything wrong with them, and b if there is something wrong with them, try and cure them. Um, the first stage is this like little interview where you uh, they kind of uh, the, these sort of characters tell you a little bit about themselves and you have to identify certain sort of symptoms. Um, that's quite simple. Like there's no timer ticking down. It's quite gentle. Um, if you get questions, if you identify the wrong symptoms in a particular block of text, uh, it does deduct time from your day. So you've got like 200 units of time, I guess they're seconds, um, to to kind of get stuff done. So 
you can kind of start eating into what you can achieve in a day that way. Um, if you, once you've identified them, you can decide if they are insane or not insane. Uh, if they're not insane, they obviously thank you and, and go about their business, but you don't make much money from that because you're there to kind of cure people. I'll tell you about the money element in a second. Um, if they are insane, do you then have to cure them? And here's where it's like a little bit more different from, from Papers, Please, in terms of like its interface, in that you have all these like weird devices that serve different purposes um, that you have to use to kind of clean, clean their sort of heads out. And their, their problems are kind of represented by a kind of clutter of symbols. Um, you have this sort of base machine which can eliminate any of the symbol kinds, but it's very slow. It's just very, you sort of press this button and this sort of meter builds. It's a bit like a golf swing meter, and you have to kind of let oh, it go right. in this, at this tiny top spot to kind of combat it. But um, that's fine for your first few jobs because you can just take your time and kind of clear out things. But as you get a bit of money, you can invest in new technologies which target uh, specific kinds of symbols. And the idea being that as you play the game, you build up this sort of big kind of toolkit of things so that you can really efficiently tackle each person. Um, money, I will say, does factor into it because there's this sort of, a, a bit like Pepper's Please, there is this, this sort of sense that you have a life to live and you have costs to make up. And if you can't sustain your costs in this society, you get booted out. Um, nice. so you're trying to make enough money every day to pay your wages while also getting enough to, uh, develop the technology uh, to pay your wages, to pay your living costs while also getting enough technology to be able to tackle like harder cases. Um, because if you mess up in the time limit, you have to go back the next day and do them, do them afresh. So, you know, it, it, it soon ramps up and it's very easy to lose. Um, I haven't, I'm going to put my hand because I haven't finished this game. Um, because I'm quite bad at time and money management. Um, also, it just took me a while to kind of figure out what was going on, and I made some unwise purchasing decisions. Um, another, so one thing I really, really like about this is that all the different devices are like they're very distinct. They each have a different interface. They have like a different gimmick. Um, they're all kind of like. Um, Every one of them, the way you interact with it, like you can do it really fast. You can make it a lot more efficient, which is is, is kind of key to winning the game. But um, like if you mess up the device, you can hurt them, you can damage them, you can stress them out too much. And if you feel their stress meter, you basically shatter their minds and basically lose that patient and you, you don't get uh, any reward for that. Um, at the same time, you can also... Like the, the natural uh, process of cleaning their insanity out, like uh, slowly depletes their personality. Okay. You can basically heal them, but like wipe out their personality in the process. And the state doesn't really care. The state pays you, but there's this underrunning story that, you know, wiping personalities isn't good, that you're damaging these people. Some of them come back and like some of them, there are consequences down the line for like, wiping their personalities or you hear from their families who kind of sort of say, you know, you've really damaged them. So it's asking you to make this sort of uh, efficiency slash morality question of like, mm -hmm. you know, do you actually want to try and like heal them fully, you know, which takes more time. You can invest in technology to kind of like reinstall sort of personality chunks as you go along that slows the whole process down. So there's always different like sort of time management sort of questions in the mix, which is quite good fun. Um, but yeah, it's it's more just like as a series of like weird interfaces and strange technologies to sort of prod and work out how they kind of function. It's it's got a, I don't know. It feels like it has a bit more like variety to it than than something like Papers Please. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously there's there's big Papers Please uh, vibes off of this, but that is a you know stamp the passport or you know, kind of, that's, that's how you interact. Yeah, there's, and in there, there's obviously like, let, you know, you're going through all the paperwork yeah, and you're trying yeah. to work out whether or not they're, they're, they're safe or not. Um, here, it's a bit more like, the actual interactions are a bit more interesting, I think. And I like the kind of arcadiness of like, you know, you want to push these machines as fast as possible, but at the same time, you actually want to succeed. You don't want to damage them in the process. 
it's got enough going for it that it has it has quite a different energy. Um, like there's a sense of sort of feeling out some of these machines, like how they work, their kind of quirks, um, which I quite like. Which makes if you do fail, coming back and doing like reruns, you know, isn't too much of a problem because there's some interesting stuff to do. Um, I really like the characters; like they're they're very um, uh, like clearly written. Very like each case feels quite bespoke. They're not just a sort of generic collection of sort of stats. You know, they've got quite weird problems. Some of them are genuinely kind of like quite borderline, quite hard to work out where you stand on them. Like, you know, are they are they decent? You know, some of them I sort of stamped not insane. And then like a couple of days later, you know, their problems properly manifested and they did something terrible or whatever. And then I felt a bit bad about it. I mean, there's this also this sort of underrunning narrative of like your daughter's been taken away to this sort of facility. You're trying to kind of level up your citizen status being able to go and see her, a bit like the family background story in Papers, Please. Mm -hmm. So, like, how you play the game, how efficient you play the game kind of opens or closes the kind of underlying kind of narrative thrust. Um, You know, you start getting secret messages from sort of, like, what might be sort of freedom fighters, and it's, you know, do you you work with them? Do you kind of dob them into the powers that be, you know, Maybe like reasonably standard dystopian sort of tropes, but yeah, it all combines in quite a nice way. It's quite slick, it's quite fast moving. I love the art style of it. I love all the the weird graphics on the the strange interfaces. Yeah, this it, one lo- here, it, it looks great. Sort of turn it up to um, kind of like eliminate emotions in people's voices and stuff. Like all the all the descriptions of the machinery is quite twisted and weird. Okay, it has a, it feels a little bit like sort of Brazil. You know, in that it's kind of got a bit of Terry Gilliam energy in that there's this sort of everything slightly weird, the slightly sort of mm-hmm. organic, sort of bio-organic element to some of the interfaces. It's all a little bit sort of squishy and fleshy looking. Um, yeah, it's a really odd, really odd one. But uh, <laughs> no, it, it looks, but at the same time, it looks really, and from what you've described, it looks really interesting, really kind of different. You know? Yeah, I just like the little pictures of the people in the top right corner, like being um, forced to have all these like strange machines kind of pop and squeak at them um, to try and heal them. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's smart. It's a smart little game. Um, you know, I'm going to persevere with it and try and push through to the end. Um, but seems like a pretty safe bet. I think it's like I don't know, fifteen quid or something. Nice little thing. Mm, looks good. Mind scanners. Uh, yeah, I might, I might give that a go. Uh, something that I did give a go already over the weekend is talking about games delivering on their promise, or maybe not delivering on their promise earlier. Um, a video game that I think it does is Knockout City. No, oh, not this again. <laughs> uh, see, that's that's kind of how I feel as well. But at the same time, it's like. I have to say, I think they've done pretty all right here. Okay. And I think this is something that if you have Xbox Game Pass for PC, tick, uh, you should give this a go because it is, you know, it's at no extra cost for subscribers. Um, and it's kind of good, frivolous, bullshit fun. How very time splitters. Uh, yeah, uh, dodgeball game, main mode is 3v3, best three rounds, first to ten knockouts in each round. To knock out an opponent, you have to hit them twice uh, or get them to fall off the side of the arena. And the joy of this game, is pro- speaking as somebody who doesn't like multiplayer games because I'm shite at them, I don't want to be the best in the world at Call of Duty, but I want to be given a chance here it's, yeah, it's very easy to pick up and just jump in and start firing balls at others. And I think an important thing in this is having your two hit points. I think that's a wonderful idea because especially when you're new to the game, it gives you a chance to get your bearings after your hit. Uh, yeah, I, I, I sort of appreciate that. But it, it's very easy to play, you know, grab a ball, chuck it at somebody. But there are some complexities, some of which I suppose I didn't really see loads but it is the 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 first weekend but some are easy to pick up like curving a ball and lobbing a ball 
you'll wrap your head around that relatively quickly. Mm. And you know, there are there are special balls as well that kind of they'll change how you interact with the the maps and all that. But yeah, like you, I suppose the thing is you you also have to keep some bit of defense in your mind as well because and just talking about like the the minor complexities, I suppose. Like you can catch an incoming ball, you can deflect incoming balls. It's 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 just it's it, it's la- the language that it uses is communicated superbly. It really is the the kind of bigger moves that you can do, the more involved moves. Yeah, I I didn't really see them involved uh, or being utilized. Excuse me, that much again first weekend, but there are some more different ones that can do like super mega damage but the maps themselves again like very enjoyable they're they're sort of a, a good mix between tight enough that the the action never screeches to a halt but also vast enough that it gives you a chance to escape or to like to flank enemies as well and and they just i suppose there's variety as well in how you interact with these maps because one of them is on a construction yard and has a big swinging wrecking ball. There's another that takes place in a, I don't know, a multi-story car park, whatever the fuck it was, I don't know. Uh, but it has these uh, pipe system that you can travel around. I like them. Yeah, I, I just kind of quite enjoyed this game. Like, I don't yeah, listen, think... There's no shame in that. Don't be embarrassed because your new favourite game is... <laughs> is um... Yeah, it is my new favourite game. I love What's it. What's again? Uh, it's the best game of all time is what it is. It's called Knockout City. Of course I wouldn't be embarrassed. Greatest game of all time. 10 out of 10. Rock, Raper, Shotgun is introducing scores specifically for Knockout City. Um, <laughs> right. But but yeah, like, you know, it'll need to introduce stuff as it goes along. Like, at launch, that 3v3 mode... It, like yeah, it's fine. It's the base, the basis of the game, I suppose. But there is this, uh, what's it called in Call of Duty? Kill confirmed, where you pick up the dog tags. There's a similar thing in this. <laughs> it has a nicer name, like Diamond Rush or something. I don't know what it's <laughs> yeah. called. Uh, but where a downed opponent uh, diamonds will pop out of him, you have to go and collect them. And there's a one v one face off mode as well. A, a lot, a lot of this depends on whether people take to it, like all online multiplayer games, like what, what does their roadmap look like? What are they going to be, uh, are they going to have uh, limited time modes um, that they're uh, going to be introducing like other multiplayer games? Are they, uh, are they, is it going to have a community? Are they going to embrace it? Like that, obviously that's where Knockout City will live and die. But for a couple of hours over the weekend, I was entertained. At the same time, I do want to say this because I think we've mentioned it on the show that this, rather than a Fortnite or an Apex or whatever, this feels like EA's play for the Rocket League dollar. And I think, to me, this feels better than Rocket League because Rocket League always, there's a, a randomness to Rocket League that I've never really taken to. Whereas this is, this is skill-based, you know? Mm but at the same time kind of welcoming enough because like there's a, it locks on in the character when you um when you're holding the trigger to to fire the ball so mm. it brings you in and it introduces these new mechanics the complexities uh and says go on have a bit of a laugh nice Sounds and fun. i did i did so you know a laugh was had xbox game pass for pc get on it get on it uh so those are the video games we've played over the past seven days. So now it is time to test one another in a little game we like to call Mystery Steam Reviews. It's time for Mystery Steam Reviews. Yeah. Yes! Mystery Steam Reviews is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where I, Colin Mahern, and he, Matthew Castle, test the knowledge of one another via Steam reviews that are a mystery. And the rules haven't changed this week and they are as follows for those new. Both I and Matthew bring three Steam reviews to the MSO Arena, but we omit the name of the game associated with each review. Our opponent must correctly guess the game attached to each review. One correct answer equals one point. While both of us have 90 seconds on each MSR, we both also have help in the form of three lifelines. These lifelines can be used at any stage during battle and also pause the 90 second timer. Each lifeline can only be used once and they are as follows. Publisher, the hot new lifeline. Uh, that is where the hot seat haver learns uh, the publisher of the game. Second opinion, where a second review is given to the fiery chair sitter. And genre, the genre of the game is revealed. 
to the one with the warm arse. Mm. This week, the theme is video games set in Japan slash video games that have a considerable portion of their game set in Japan. Uh, Japan, mm-hmm. even. Uh, relative. You know. Yeah. Go to Japan, basically. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You say the game, you say the word Japan, and people are like, yeah, fair enough. Yes, exactly. Uh, so let's see if we all stuck to the brief. I think... <laughs> no, I did. I think I did. Yeah, yeah I did. I, yeah. yeah. We'll see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Matthew, your first Mystery Steam review this Hit week... Hit me up is as follows. Went in assuming this was some sort of satire on visual novel culture. Surprised to see it is a fully serious visual novel with enjoyable characters. Individual paths are short, but have an overarching story to uncover as part of the whole. And that's from Paint. It is recommended. (laughs) Paint. (laughs) Recommended. Uh, 2.9 hours on record. Matthew, your time starts now. Well, first off, wonderful, wonderful username, Teent. Uh, I don't even know what that is. Right. Uh, so, satire and visual novel culture. So it's clearly a visual novel going in. It looks like it, you know, it, it may suggest visual novel in its title in some way. Um, but it's got good characters and it's short. I mean, 2.9 hours. Very short for a visual novel. Um... In terms of, like, a game which has a reputation of being about sort of visual novels, or that you might say that about, um, uh, the, I'm thinking the literature, is it Doki Doki Literature Club? Um, which I've not actually played, uh, but I'm I'm assuming it is set in Japan, um... I can't think of any other visual novels that to like look at it from afar without getting super obscure, which I don't think you would do because, you know, you're a decent dude. Ish. Decent ish. Um, That's for the lovers of salt, by the way, who are complaining (laughs) that they don't get enough. I I thought I'd sprinkle little hints of it um, just to get you back on board. I'm going to say Doki Doki Literature Club. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. All right. So, visual novel, pretty clear from the text there. Um, this person said, I oh, thought it was going to be a satire going in. Whatever they mentioned about, you know, deep characters or whatever it was. You've ended up on Doki Doki Literature Club, which indeed, visual novel from a couple of years ago. Free to play on Steam. I'd recommend it. It's quite good. But is it the correct answer? Will it cost you dearly? Matthew Castle, I can tell you that the correct answer is... Hatterful Boyfriend. Oh, piss on it. The one with the frickin' birds. Mm Mm-hmm. Why does that look like a satire? It's a a thing about romancing birds. I mean, I suppose it's birds rather than humans. Mm, Kind of... Oh, shit. I did think it was odd because the one thing I would say about that review with Doki 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 Club I know that that game has spooky undertones which I'm surprised you wouldn't mention unless it's like agreed that people don't really mention that um, for sort of spoiler purposes in which case apologies for just (laughs) mentioning it Um, but no instead it was the satire of the bird game I guess that's is that a satire um hmm a sprinkle of salt. I think it's bullshit, but anyway, that's fine. <laughs> uh, Matthew, could I have my first Mystery Steam review, please? This is not a stealth game as advertised. The sheer amount of enemies means that if you click a sixteenth of an inch in the wrong direction, reload. Position the camera slightly wrong, reload. Throw your one shuriken at the wrong guy, reload. Says Voivod Pure. Not recommended, with only three hours on record. Time starts now. Okay. So loads of enemies that if you click a sixteenth of an inch in the wrong direction, 
That's important. Position the camera slightly wrong. Reload. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Stealth game. Where you click, that feels important. That doesn't feel like a third-person action game, like, um, I don't know, a Neo or whatever else that it could be. Uh, throw your shuriken. If you click a sixteenth of an inch. All right, so what game could it be where, like, you're clicking, not an action game, but sort of maybe ninjas or something in this? Um, oh, balls. Um, I mean, I know, um, oh, what's the game that you like from the people who did, um, oh, Jesus, I'll never think of it. I'll never think of the name. Um, the Desperados people. It's, ah. Uh, oh. Uh, I'm not going to think of the name. Shogun. No, that's the other one. Oh, uh, the other one. Shadow. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shadow Doom, is that your full answer? <laughs> the time was against me, Chris, and I... I probably, if I had another while, maybe I wouldn't have would have gotten it. Ah, oh, it's Shadow something, I'm sure. Anyway, Shadow Doom, final answer. Shadow Doom is your final answer. So you identified this as a clicky stealth game, lots of enemies. Not a third person action game. Well, I mean, it is technically third person, what this game, but the correct answer is Shadow Tactics, Blades of the Shogun. Shadow you said Doom. Shadow, you were very close. <laughs> I was like, you do know what it is, but you don't. I, I I, hope people agree that it's okay of me not to give you that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't Which, get the name. I think you did know what it was, but I, I do think the name is important. The name is important in, in this game, yeah. <laughs> I just no, think in a game uh, guessing that. the names of games... That's yeah. a rule we can't really back down on, I'm names afraid. Are, names are quite important, yes. <laughs> uh, Matthew, would you like your second Mystery Steam review? Hit me up. I don't think there are games that make you feel like a ninja more than this game. The stealth, the murder, the speed, the acrobatics. This game truly... dot dot dot... hits the mark on all of these. And that's from Banana... It is recommended, 16.3 hours on record, 10.2 hours, a time of review. Matthew, your time starts now. Right. Wow. So you're a ninja. I mean, that instantly puts me in mind of, like, Sekiro. Um, that's got stealth, murder, acrobatics. I mean, you can kind of jump on roofs and things. This game truly hits the mark. Is that a joke? That feels like a joke. Is Sekiro... He's, you're not called Mark in it. <laughs> he's not called Mark Sekiro, is he? <laughs> uh, other ninja games we might... Mark's a very Western name. Like, like a game that's set in Japan, but you play a guy called Mark? I don't know. Uh... <sighs> I feel like it's Sekiro. There are other ninja games. Maybe if, I tell you what. Give me the publisher on this. Okay, pausing the timer at twenty or thirty-five say seconds. Activision, and I'll be it's Sekiro. Okay, uh, pausing the timer, thirty-five seconds. The publisher of this video game is. Uh, where is it? The publisher is Microsoft Studios. Microsoft Studios. And I'm restarting the timer now. Oh shit, that's not secure at all. Microsoft Studios. Microsoft Ninja Game. Oh my god. Uh a second opinion. Oh, we're gonna pause the timer at 18 seconds. Oh, this is bold doing it this late in the game, but I've gotta get a point. Uh, Matthew using his Oops. second opinion. So the second opinion of this game. Sharp controls, side-scroller, 
Samurai Jack with elements of Tenshu and Metal Gear Stealth. Game is great! There is a full review here somewhere, but you'd have to be better than a ninja to find it. What? <laughs> Ignore that last part. Ignore that last Good. part. Thanks give me a second review that even no, you don't understand. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the, t- take in the rest of it. That's the last part is bullshit. Um, so yeah, restarting the timer 18 seconds now. Oh, God. Sharp oh, control, so- side scroller, samurai jack. S- uh, side element. scroller makes me think of that. Um, Mark, is it Mark of the Ninja? Oh, Mark. That would be the Mark joke. But that wasn't Microsoft. That was someone else, isn't it? It was. Is that Clay? Ah, shit. Uh, Mark of the Ninja. Just in the nick of time, Mark of the Ninja. So, is it called that? I think it's. Called you, that. you were trying to kind of unearth what the all the little bits of this review um you were thinking Sekiro wondering what all that Mark business was about it's not called Mark um Mark Sekiro uh and I am uh, I'm Mark Sekiro <laughs> he works in the Ford dealership um <laughs> But, yeah, you've ended up on Mark of the Ninja after using your publisher and your second opinion. And I can tell you, Matthew, that the correct answer is... Mark of the Ninja. Oh! I, I genuinely didn't know that was a... That's a Microsoft thing. Published by Microsoft, yeah. What? That's great. Did you ever play it? What did they shout about? That doesn't sound right. Oh, well. Uh, I'm Mark not going to be salty because I got a point, but... That doesn't sound right to me. What? Did they publish this? Yeah. No, they did. But it's on PlayStation as well, isn't it? They, I mean, you can check if you want. It's Microsoft Studios. We'll, I'll wait. I'll wait and I'll tell the people at home that if you haven't played Mark of the Ninja, you really should. It is a terrific game from about 10 years ago. Yeah, I think, I think it was Mark 2011. Mark on Steam, it says it's published by Clay. Does it? <laughs> that was published by Microsoft. Did you do this on memory? No, I checked. Mark of the Ninja. What does it say on Wikipedia? Uh, uh, on Wikipedia, it says, yeah, it does say Microsoft Studios. Oh, was we're that because ha- it was an Xbox Ar- Live Arcade game first? Have we run into an issue with the publisher Lifeline? Um, no, well, I, well, no, it depends where you draw it from, because I take the publisher Lifeline from from Steam uh, do I I've actually taken it from a combination of Wikipedia and Steam thinking about it we'll talk off Mike and we'll figure that out yeah. which, <laughs> where we take that from um, but well, anyway well, listen I got the point so you know, Matthew could I have my second opinion or second opinion second mystery steam review please controls are abysmal troops facing in the wrong direction constantly fighting with the camera to get a decent overhead view of the battlefield not worth the time and effort I have the sequel to try next hopefully it has more intuitive controls says Sci Scream they do not recommend it after 1.7 hours and what an unhappy 1.7 hours they were <laughs> Time starts now. All right. This is where, thankfully, the first, your first review twigged something in me. And I think this is Total War Shogun. Or Shogun Total War. It's one or the other. But, like, a decent overhead view of the battlefield. It was clicking in the first review that kind of made me think that. But, like, um, troops facing the wrong direction so there's troops there's loads of people <sighs> yeah Total War Shogun or Shogun Total War I can't remember which it's one or the other uh, it's the same game I just can't remember which comes first if it um, was that game and I'm not saying it is I would give it to you either way on that okay thank you um, if it I was that game. do I use a lifeline to make sure if I use publisher it would be Sega wouldn't it I think that's Sega yeah pausing the timer 25 seconds gonna make sure could I have my publisher lifeline please Matthew the publisher Microsoft Facebook Studio is <laughs> Clay, Clay Entertainment <laughs> let me just let me just uh, 
I'm gonna look it up. Don't know it off the top of my head. <laughs> it's very hard to do find. Want... Mm. Oh shit! Is, is it? Do a... you want the publisher on? Which would you like it from? Wikipedia <laughs> or Steam? <laughs> oh, there's an issue with the publisher lifeline. Shit. Um. Uh, I don't know. Wikipedia. <laughs> you'd like it. You'd like it from Wikipedia, would you? Yeah. Uh, Electronic Arts. Oh. Okay. Restarting the timer now. This is a Microsoft Studio situation, obviously, and I don't know what to do now. The only thing in my head is Total War Shogun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have to just Total War Shogun. Can't think of anything else. Is that your final answer? Yeah, the EA has scared. It scared me now, but oh, I'm not sure. This you identified that this is a probably a strategy game. You said Battlefield Troops, which led you to think Shogun Total War or Total War Shogun. I would accept either. If it is that game, the correct answer is Shogun Total War. Yeah! Uh, apparently, the original published by EA, uh, but on Steam, it's a Sega because. They now own Creator, you know, they're obviously publishing everything. <laughs> I can't believe there's an issue with the publisher. I didn't, oh, I well, didn't see this going. Is, that lifeline is fucked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we could just, would you want to just in future say Steam? I think we should say Steam in future, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, anyway, I'm glad I <laughs> not, nothing came to me. EA, or it also offered the budget... Um, label sold out. Oh, you need to get those, those when they sold the games cheaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool, I said that. Oh, it was published by Sold Out. <laughs> Matthew, would you like your third and final mystery Steam review? Scooby Doo for perverts, right? And, fantastic. And that's, that's from Catty. It is recommended 43.2 hours on record, 41 hours. A time of review. Matthew, your time starts now. I mean, this suggests that Scooby-Doo in itself isn't for perverts. <laughs> fair, fair. Ah, um, uh, Scooby-Doo for perverts. So, mystery solving. That's, that's how I'm reading Scooby-Doo, probably. Like... I don't think there's any game about... I mean, Scooby-Doo for perverts could be, like, a very intense love between a man and a dog. There's <laughs> probably a few of those that... games on Steam. Would they be? Oh, yeah, they probably would be allowed. Um, but I don't think you've gone into, like, deep into weird anime porn games for this. Um, you know, I didn't expect you to dip into your own library of games um, to come up with suggestions. This is probably going to be more mainstream. Scooby Doo for perverts. Uh, what's the genre? Yeah, uh, pause the timer. Thirty-five seconds. The genre of this Hi. video game. What the hell is this? Uh, what is the genre of this video game? Is a role-playing video game. A role-playing video game. Uh, restarting the timer. Thirty-five seconds now. A role-playing game. Video game. God, I thought you were going to say like visual novel or puzzle game. I thought this might be like Danganronpa, where it's like solving mysteries, which is like Scooby Doo, and it's pervy because it's got some like a role playing game that's like Scooby Doo for perverts. I mean, uh, like near or or or, or are you Kuzuki? Okay? Who's it like a dragon? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> How's that 
<laughs> like Skippy Do, you never know, dog. Is there any Yakuza game where you've got a dog? <laughs> I thought near because she's got like. Oh no, in my head she had a haircut a bit like Velma, but that's probably niche. <laughs> I don't think she does. Uh God. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. So, Scooby Doo for Parvis, you've ended up on Yakuza <laughs> Like a Dragon. <laughs> Scooby Doo, uh, a TV show where there is a gang of people who travel around. Yakuza Like a Dragon, a gang, travel around. The perverts part, you know, there are some. There's kind of maybe a bit of innuendo in Yakuza Like a Dragon. Um, you collect perverts. You do, you do. That's more like Pokemon for perverts. And a role-playing video game. That's, you know, you could call Yakuza Like a Dragon yeah. a role-playing video game. Matthew Castle. The correct answer is... Persona 4 Golden. Oh, of course it is. Travelling around oh, the van. Oh, of course it is. A lot of perverts <laughs> in, in Persona. I suppose a lot of perverts like Persona. Oh. Of the course gang. it is. You were, I, I was, a gang I was kind of teenager of, solving a mystery. I was urging you. You were focusing on the dog an awful lot. And in my head, I was like, don't think about the gang. The gang <laughs> together. Matthew, could I have my third and final mystery steam review, please? Plus, beautiful area. Plus, great glory building to explore. Plus, all doors locked on corresponding disguise. Plus, Kill Bill. Plus, surgery room has so much opportunity and is very creative. Says Zoe Squid. They recommend it for 12 hours on record. Time starts now. All right. The important things to take here. Uh, you can explore buildings. Doors locked on corresponding disguise. Kill Bill is... Uh, I don't know. I, do, I, I can't think of what game references Kill Bill. Where you wear a yellow jumpsuit. Surgery Room has so much opportunities and is very creative. Surgery Room. The Surgery Room. What is the Surgery Room? Um, Corresponding disguise. Pause the timer 53 seconds. Matthew, could I have... Both my genre and my second opinion, please. Yeah. In whatever order you would like to give them to me. <laughs> Buildings to explore. Kill Bill. Genre is described as a stealth video game. Okay. Second opinion. The map was okay. The sushi part was interesting. Finally, the game has completely released. Okay. Uh, restarting the timer 53 seconds now. Finally. Sushi part. I don't know. Fucking loads of games. Yakuza like a dragon. Um, finally... Finally, the game has released. Has completely released. Has completely released. Early access? Episodic? Um, stealth game. Doors lock. Um, Hitman. 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 Doors, uh, disguises. Um, finally, the game has been released. J the Japan map. Hitman. Hitman. <laughs> Is that your final answer? Yeah, but just one Hitman, not five. <laughs> it's not Hitman seven times in a row. You're thinking Japan. You're thinking maybe episodically released. You mentioned in the mix there, doors open on disguise. Does Hitman have a surgery room set in Japan? It does. The correct answer is Hitman. Yes! Get in. Oh. Get in. Is that Hokkaido? Is that it's your Hokkaido. Your favourite, isn't it? I think. Oh, yes, my favourite map. 
I realize it's only one sixth of Hitman. But listen, you got it. So I ain't apologizing. And I'm not going to complain because 2 1. Yes. You've got nothing to complain about. Champion, champion. Yeah, uh, oh, look at it. You, you, oh, it rubbing oh, it in my face. Sweet so. victory. Sweet, yes. sweet victory. This is why I don't like it when you win because you're like this. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm With sorry. The arm pumping. But that's just because I get into it, Matthew. I just really get excited. Yeah. I was urging you to get the Scooby Doo for Parvitz. Oh, Parvitz. no. I can't believe I didn't get that. I'm so dumb. Uh, but yeah, that is another Mr. Steam reviews for this week. So now it's time to turn to you, lovely listeners and viewers, for your burning questions. Yes, Burning Questions is the part of the PC Gaming Week Spot, where indeed we take your burning questions. No, that makes sense, really. Uh, you can email <laughs> us at any stage throughout the week, weekspot at rockpapershotgun.com, and then we may read out your correspondence on the show. Um, so, uh, I will say, right, I'm going to st- say this off the top. Um, we'll get through as many as we can here. I don't know how we went long again this week, uh, but we're it's a bank holiday week this week, so we're going to be recording next week's episode a bit earlier, which also means we probably won't have as much time to play new video games. We'll still try and hopefully be news happening, but we might just do like a bumper um, burning questions on the next episode, we'll, but we'll get through as many as we can now. Firstly, Mog, who gave us 10 English pounds, during the YouTube premiere of the last episode of the PC Gaming Week spot, Mog said, uh, where is it? Here. Uh, Mog said, in Mass Effect, you have to make some important decisions. What important decisions have you made in your lives? Looking forward to the show as always, Mog. Uh, thanks very much, Mog. A bit deep. Um, important decisions. First one that comes to my mind is moving country, I suppose. Sending a shop in a, a foreign land where I didn't know too many people. And six years, is it? Six years later, I'm still here. So I suppose that's pretty important. Um, Matthew, any, anything come to mind? Keep, keeping it relatively light. Like, or, you know, whatever you like. Yeah, no, I, I like change, changing, changing jobs when there's like a big move involved. Feels like a bit, you know, when I, when I left Bath originally to go to London to do official Nintendo magazine kind of set me on a slightly different path, H- hilariously a path that brought me back to Bath two years later. Um, but uh, yeah, that was pretty big. Also, you know, changing from magazines to doing like video stuff was quite a big decision. Without mm-hmm. that, no weak spot. Some people would say, was that a good move? Was that a bad move? <laughs> what, moving from magazines to video? No, like what? No, that we have weak spot. Oh, right. That was, okay. a, that was, that was a weak spot joke. That was good, good. So the the people like self deprecation. In fairness, they're, yeah. they're they're fans of that. Um, and another super chat we have uh, is from Mister Wilk, who gave fifty Polish zloty. Thank you very much, Mister Wilk. And they said, "Columns, hello and welcome." Is like a healing bam after a long day at work. Thanks for your work, guys. Thank you very much, Mister Wilk. Hello and welcome. That was good. I appreciate it. You also the- say the other one that always stands out for me is when you say, um, the one with the warm arse. That was good. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate you doing the accent as well. It was very, Those very are good. Those are the two things that I, jump on, out on me every week. <laughs> on, honestly, I couldn't tell. Like, you know, if I just moved my mouth when you said those words, <laughs> people would be like, who's, who's talking? That's so crazy. Um, <laughs> We have a long letter from Carl. Carl says, Hi. Firstly, thanks for a frankly marvellous show. I enjoy a few gaming podcasts, but it's refreshing to not have to listen to an excessively boisterous American accent and also to presenters that have a reasonable grasp of the use of sarcasm. Oh, thanks. To we. Um, on to my question. Showing my age a bit here, but back in the day, I was the proud own- owner of an Amstrad Mega PC, which was a PC with a built-in Sega Mega Drive. You would slide the front panel to either to reveal either the floppy drive or cartridge slot. I was, as you can imagine, uh, envy of all being able to switch between Monkey Island and Sonic with ease. 
Clearly you two are a great double act, but if you could have a manufacturer create a PC and console hybrid these days, what would it be? There's the dull predictable PC PS5 option of course, but what would you go but would you go for something a bit more unusual? RTX 3090 PC with the SNES, for example? Thanks for thanks again for being the highlight of my podcast week. Kind regards, Carl from Burton Latimer. Brackets, where Weetabix comes from. <laughs> Actually, uh, it comes from the kitchen cupboard. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Carl. I mean, yeah, the, bo- the boring option is PC and PlayStation 5. Because I don't know don't... if I would go for that, though. Like You go PC and Switch? I think, yeah, like PS5, PlayStation exclusives aren't all that. I'd go PC Switch. Something in which you can play PC and Nintendo games is more important than something you can play PC and, you know, whatever fucking remake of The Last of Us they're going to give us next. PC, like, super, get the, get that ray tracing on um, the next Zelda and the next Mario and the next whatever yeah, else. Just, just sort, out the, sort out the frame rate a bit of... Um, Breath of the Wild, where it gets a little wonky. That would be that would be good. Um, I would also decide I mean, that could just be the next Switch. Uh, yeah, uh, it's quite hard to play GameCube stuff these days. Something with a GameCube in it. I want that GameCube, which has a PC in it, but it also has a GameCube in it. Mm. I mean, there are ways. Do you know what? Actually, we have a question that sort of relates to this, if I can find it. Uh, so I could kind of tie this nicely into what we're saying here, but I cannot find it now, <laughs> sadly. Where's that? So I, oh, here it is from Bobby. Uh, Bobby said, what's your views on the abandonware community, morally slash ethically, uh, i.e. a community working to preserve and distribute games that are no longer supported or sold by their original publishers? I was an active member back in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was only when I was older and wiser that I realised how legally iffy it was. We thought we were doing noble work. I was also exposed to, played and enjoyed loads of great games that would have otherwise been completely unavailable. Please don't forward my details to the authorities. Love the show, Bobby. Thank you very much, Bobby. Just because when you were taught, you know, emulators and all that stuff, just kind of reminded me of that. But yeah... uh, but this is different. These are he's talking about games that aren't available. Games mm. that the only way to play these games is uh through these legally iffy means. And mm. it sounds like a sting operation, this question. Uh, are you a cop, Bobby? Um uh, <laughs> uh, he's a Bobby. Oh <gasps> shit. Um that's quite good. Like that well. <laughs> uh I mean All I cops know are Bobbies. Uh, what's his name in America is doing a lot for game preservation, Frank Cifaldi. Um, and I think there's some element of uh, kind of uh, maybe kind of like tra- trying to source some of these games that are no longer in print or no longer available. And maybe perhaps in those moments, you do have to find other ways of acquiring them. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I like. I'm definitely all for the idea of um things being like maintained, and there being a copy somewhere of something. Um, next question. Um, <laughs> it's true. I don't know. It's a. It's, it's a tricky one. Like, I guess the people who own these things, they reserve the right to, oh yeah, like to to do with them as they wish. Um, it's a shame. I don't think they should kick off if someone's trying to preserve something which they aren't doing a good job of preserving. Um, I mean, the thing but, is, like, yeah, like, yeah, it, it is there. If if games companies wanted to, I suppose, kind of like what that um, remember uh, what's his chops from a few from. Oh, what was his name? The Stadia guy who got into a bit of hot water when he was talking about streamers and whatever else. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, if if publishers wanted to, no, they would be very silly to do so. But if they wanted to, they could just go, no, that's our game. You can't play that on the internet. Uh, so like, Yeah, it, I don't know. It just, I, I always feel like these things are slightly, like, there are people with, like, some legit concerns and there are also some just 
dodgy motherfuckers. It's a bit like when piracy carts were selling like gangbusters on DS. And you had a certain corner of the internet who were like, oh no, I have it because I really like the DS demo scene or something. And you'd be like, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> mm. um, I, I don't know. Like, I like the homebrew scene on DS. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you do. Nothing, yeah. nothing to do with all those. <laughs> Never having to pay for a Nintendo game ever again on DS. Uh, uh, but but you, I don't know. Yeah. It's probably a sensible thing that has some fucking terrible advocates or just dodgy looking advocates where you're like, mm. yeah. Yeah. But um, I don't know. So yeah, thank you very much for that, Bobby, and thank you to everyone for that was some se- good fencing. Sending us your burning <laughs> questions. Um, so yeah, as I say, we're doing we'll we'll make it our business to do a longer burning questions bit on the next episode. So yeah, if you want to get your questions in, send them to yeah, weekspot at rockpapershotgun dot com. Uh, oh. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, serving you, lovely Weekspawn viewers and listeners. Uh, if you want more of us, there are ways to get more. You can follow us on social media, at rockpapershot, at column underscore ahern, at mrbasil underscore pesto. If you want to talk to some like-minded people, head on over to Discord, discord.gg forward slash rockpapershotgun. Uh, if you want the video version of the week spot, youtube.com forward slash rock, paper, shot. Like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, all that jazz. Or if you want the audio version, subscribe to the Peace Gaming Week Spot podcast via all your podcatching apps, including but not limited to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, etc., etc. But for all of your PC gaming needs, head on over to rockpapershotgun.com. Matthew, another weak spot in the bag. I'm not sure what I'm going to play over the next couple of days. Going to try and get something played before we do the the next episode. Um, But yeah, fun times ahead, as always. Are you all right, Matthew? Are you still awake? Sorry. All right. (laughs) Still engaged. Engaged. My phone phone pinged me. This is is just a bit where you talk about all the boring ways people can engage. (laughs) Uh, engagement is shit. Get off all social media, kids. You'll be much better off. Oh, I do but, like the bit that's coming up in a second where you uh, say, "But now, phone." <laughs> it is time for my least favorite part of the show. This is the Paris Shorms bid, the listener, the viewer, the consumer. Adieu. So say goodbye, Mr. Matthew Castle. Goodbye. And say goodbye, Colin Mahern, Sloan. Go There it is. Uh,